بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری ویسر لی امری وحل العقدت من لسانی یفقہ قولی آنریبل میجر جنرل خالد آمیر جعفری ریزیڈنٹ سینٹر فار گلوبل اینڈ سٹریٹیجک سٹڈیز آنریبل ڈینز یونیورسٹی آف پشاور ڈائریکٹر شیخ زیب اسلامک سینٹر سپیکرز ایچ او ڈیز فیکلٹی ممبرز ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس آنریبل گیس لیڈیز اینڈ جینٹل مین السلام علیکم مائی ٹاپک از آئیڈیالوجی اینڈ دی پرنسپلز آف پاکستان اے ہسٹوریکل پرسپیکٹو This topic is a bit academic and historical in nature and I have felt that there is lack of clarity among the students and especially those students who seek selection in the competitive examinations because when I visit their academies they say that you know this is not clear to us that what is ideology. So in this brief presentation I would like to clarify and I will be happy if I find some time if some questions come from the audience I will be more than happy to respond to them. First of all the term ideology This is a Greek word which consists of two parts. First is idea, which means patron. And the other is logos, which means discourse. The discourse of patrons. It is the science of ideas and it can be defined as a system of ideas and ideals especially one which forms the basis of economic and political theory and policy. Ideology is the spirit of the state. If you have geographical boundaries of a country, if you have land and mountains and rivers, that is the tangible part of the state. But remember that there should be a spirit and rule in that body of the state. In the words of computer and IT, I would say that if geography is the hardware of the state, ideology is the software. Next. When we talk about the evolution of the ideology of Pakistan in the Indo-subcontinent, it's a story of more than 1,000 years. Muslims started coming to this part of the world exactly at the time when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, started preaching Islam in the Arabian Peninsula. Since Indians were doing their trade with the Arabian Peninsula people, therefore some Arabs families had come to India before Islam and they had settled in the Malabar coastal area of India. So they had their colonies. And when Islam was introduced by the Prophet Muhammad wasallam some of them converted to Islam and they started preaching Islam in this part of the world. So this was the beginning. Then we have in the 8th century Muhammad bin Qasim, a general and in charge of the expedition of the Muslim Caliphate who came to India. I'm just giving you the references. I'm not going into details. Then in the 11th century, Mahmud of Ghazna, Mahmud Ghaznavi, 
he started coming from the northwest. And the rest of the people have come from the northwest. So the color of Islam in the Indo subcontinent, the flavor is Central Asian. We are a little bit different from Arabs and from the Middle East because most of the people who influenced the history, the culture, and the environment of India came from the northwest side. So Ghaznawais were followed by Ghorites, Muhammad Ghori, Shahabuddin Ghori in 12th century. Then we have a slave dynasty, a dynasty which was founded by a slave. And this dynasty ruled over India for almost one century. It had some luminaries, some important people. One of them was a lady, because ladies are sitting here, Razia Sultana belonged to this dynasty. They were followed by Khiljis, the Pewar Pakhtun dynasty. They came to the last leg of 13th century and they ruled over India during the first and second decade of 14th century. Then came the Tughlaqs, the Sayyids, the Ludis, and finally the Mughals. Mughals was a dynasty which ruled over India from 16th to 19th century. So this is a story, a bird eye view of the people who were coming to India and preaching Islam. But they were not only the rulers. There was another aspect of this permeation and entry of Islam into the subcontinent. And they were the saints, the missionaries, the preachers. And those were, those were really the people who spread love and affection among the non-Muslims of this Indian subcontinent. So this was the evolution, the entry. Some of them started settling here. Some came, went back to their original lands, but impact was there. Next. So this 1,000 years must have left some impact on India. And it did leave some impact. The first one was conversion of thousands of people into the fold of Islam. The question is, why this conversion was taking place? Because in contrast, there was Hinduism, which was believing in caste system splintering the society in four groups, rulers, artisans, and you know, then the people who were at the lowest ebb of the society. As against Islam, called for unity, equality. So this was a lot of attraction for the Hindus to convert to Islam. The second thing was unification of Islam. You look at the bottom of this slide, M. N. Roy, he was a historian and one of the pillars of Marxist, Marxism in India. He has written a book, The Historical Role of Islam. Please note it down, The Historical Role of Islam. This book was written in 1939. I wish people read this book and see how Islam contributed to the development and progress of India. M. N. Roy writes in this book that Muslims are an extremely misunderstood people in India. He says that we should show respect to them because they have unified India. Unification of India. This was the first gift of Muslims which they gave to the Indian people. India was splintered and divided into thousands of tiny and small states and fiefdoms. It was Muslims rule which unified India. Then you see the impact on culture, civilization and architecture. Believe me, when I visited Delhi for the first time, it was not visibly 
looking as capital of a non-Muslim state. It was, to me, it was just like Peshawar. There was Jame Masjid, there was Qutb Binar, there was Red Fort, there was Alamgir's architecture, there were Feroz Shah Toglak Stadium, you know. The localities, the construction, the architecture was exactly the same as we have in Peshawar and Lahore. So this was the impact. You look at the gardens, you look at Taj Mahal, which is the icon and identity of India. Who constructed Taj Mahal? Who constructed Fatihpur Sikri? So all these icons, this was a gift from the Muslims towards the architecture and cultural development of India. Then there was social development and so many other impacts on the Indian society. Next, please. But when you live in a society, definitely there are some ups and downs, distortion in the Muslim faith. Sometimes Muslims deviate from their own way, sometimes some other people hatch conspiracies, etc. But when this distortion took place at different stages, Allah Almighty had a plan and he sent and he selected some people to purify the Muslims' ideas, beliefs, etc. And of them, Mujaddad al Afsani, Shah Waliullah, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, and then some religious seminaries, then some educational institutions. So as a result of these efforts, the Muslim faith and ideology was purified, reformed, and restored. And when it was restored, the Second World War broke out, which engulfed almost the entire globe. And the Second World War was a time when the British colonial power was not in a position to hold on and to maintain their colonialism in India. So they started giving the impression to the Indians that we will be going after the war. And it was a, an occasion where the Muslims' ideology came into action. And at the end of the Second World War, when possibility of Indian independence was visible and in sight, Muslims' identity was transformed into ideology of Pakistan. Next, please. Now, there are three stages of the ideology of Pakistan. The first one, evolution of Islamic ideology, and I demonstrated and displayed a slide which showed the story of 1,000 years. The second one, the narrative of separate state, Actually, it was ideology of Pakistan which ignited the spirit of independence among the Muslims. And the third one is the post-independence stage. So we have to look into the third stage of the ideology of Pakistan. The two stages have gone. Then what is ideology of Pakistan? The narrative of the Indian Muslims as a result of which they considered themselves different from Hindus. They strive for a separate state of their own, wherein they could practice their religion and cultural norms. This is ideology of Pakistan. Next, please. Two more slides. The second last is the contributions of various leaders to strengthen the concept of ideology of Pakistan. The first one was Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. He used the term nation for the first time for the Muslims. So he is the harbinger and founder of ideology of Pakistan. Then Allama Iqbal, who visualized 
and explain the ideology philosophically. And last but not the least, Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who translated this ideology into modern terminology. You remember when he was speaking at the Lahore Resolution Session, Qaid Azam said, Muslims are a separate nation from any definition of the term nation. He said that you can define nation in any dictionary of the world and Muslims are really a separate nation. So he gave it a new meaning. A modern jargon and terminology was used. 